Hello, good day, and welcome back. So, promise broken. What I said in the last section at the end of um, chapter 6, which is where we cover map, maps, I said the next chapter was going to be on go routines. No, that is because at first when I um, planned out this course, I had maps followed by channels, which is what I'm doing now. And then midway through maps, I rethought it and go, hmm, I think I should do go routines before channels. And so I changed it. And then after doing maps, and then while I did the first video on go routine and posted it, then I go, hmm, you know what? I'm going to go back to my original idea of doing channels after map. And I hope you agree that this is going to be the right way to do things for a number of reasons. One, channels are still type of a data structure that you store things in. So they look sort of like maps and, um, you know, uh, they have some of the same semantics. And so since we were just talking about storing things, we just finished up structure, sorry, structures, um, um, chapter six. Um, and in structures, we look at how, you know, it's sort of like a map, and, um, but you can name the fields and so on. So I hope you're going to like this chapter and channels and um, we'll put out go routines. If you've heard of go routines or you saw the video for while it was up for like an hour or two and you're like, oh, this is awesome. Don't worry, we'll still get to it. But um, I think you're going to see the reason why it makes sense to kind of do it this way. Now, the truth of the matter is that channel and go routines are so tightly intertwined that it's really difficult to separate them. Um, there are going to be certain things in channels we wouldn't be able to do without seeing Go routines, and there are things that you can do in Go routines without being able to see channels. That's just a matter of fact. So what we might do is a quick intro to Go routine if we need to to make our channel examples interesting, or we'll try and see if we just leave it completely for the next chapter. We'll see. At the end of the day, though, let's start with channels. So what is a channel? And so in this first video we're going to call what is a channel and we look at it very simply without going into too many details and then in order for us to be able to do anything with a go routine we'll have to create a buffer channel don't worry all that will be explained to you uh, if you want to read a little bit more on the, uh, this, in the specification they have examples there's a specific section but then it's covered and many examples are shown other places um, so feel free to um, that's reference material uh, but let's go with a definition that I grabbed right out of the specification from that very first chapter to that link that I just posted there on the previous slide. And it says, a channel provides a mechanism or a way for concurrently executing function. And later on, you're going to learn with CSPs. But here, we're just going to say concurrently executing functions. And concurrent doesn't mean parallel. Okay. Um, the way I like to think about it is um, if I'm drawing a face on the board, I'm the only person drawing the face on the board, I might work on the eye, left eye, then I might go over and work on the right eye, then I might go and work on the mouth, and then I'm going to work on the nose. All those parts of the face are independent of each other, right? I can work on the nose without messing up the eye. I can work on the left eye without worrying about the right eye and so on. And so me as the sole artist at the board, I could work on any part of this face and you're sitting back watching this drawing come together. You see different parts of the face coming together before the, com the drawing is completed. So I can say it all. I worked on the different parts of the face concurrently, right? And I, I was able to draw eye, draw another eye without it interfering with um, each other or the mouth or something. Parallel would be if I was drawing an eye, you were drawing the other eye, somebody else was drawing a nose, somebody else was drawing a mouth, somebody else was drawing, we had two individuals tackling the ear and ears and uh, somebody tackling the forehead. No, that drawing would finish hopefully much faster, so assuming we don't get into each other's way. But what you'd be able to see is these things being done together. That's parallelism, right? If, like if you have two eyes being drawn, at the same time, literally simultaneously, right? But if I could work on one eye, then stop and go and work on the other eye, um, because they're independent, I can say I can do them concurrently. They're not, um, you know, they're sequential, you know, one after the other, but I can start to do it concurrently, right? I can always switch back to one eye, to the other eye, to the other eye, and um, still wouldn't uh, mess up my drawing, okay? 
I know that's a little bit contrived and weird, but that's how ten I tend to think of it. All right. So concurrency, as you can concurrency, as you can see, we're gonna see later on, is a design pattern, and it can lead to parallelism. Okay, but concurrency doesn't mean concurrency doesn't mean parallelism. All right. So it says that oh, it's a mechanism that allow functions that are executing concurrently, which means that it's independent of each other, which means you could go into one function, start running it, stop somewhere in that function, the other function would get executed up to some arbitrary part in it, and blah, blah, blah. And the processor could bounce between the two or multiple functions, and it wouldn't be an issue, okay? It doesn't have to do it in parallel to do it sequentially. Execute this function up to the first statement, stop, go and execute the other one up to the third statement, come back to this function, continue from statement two to five, stop, go back to the other one, continue from where it left off, and either finish or part of it and blah, 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 right? And that's concurrent. Now, if we had multiple processors, we have one processor could tackle executing one function from start to finish, or if it never finishes, the next processor could tackle the other function and they would be executed in parallel, but they'd have to be written with concurrency in mind. The idea being that oh, they'd have to be written so that oh, the fact that you can bounce between them when you don't have parallel processors or multiple executing ways of executing them, that they wouldn't interfere with each other, okay? I know I'm beating that to the death, but all right, don't worry about it. If it still doesn't make sense, we're gonna see many more examples and it's gonna make sense. And when we go to Google routines, it's gonna make sense. All right, so a lot of functions that are executing concurrently to communicate with each other. Remember, when I have my function executing um, concurrently, they shouldn't interfere with each other. In, in, in other words, that one thing that happened in one messes with the state of the other. But if they need to communicate, for example, I can, channels is one way I can allow them to do that. So if one function needs to produce some value that get consumed by the other one, that's totally fine, okay? All right, by sending and receiving messages. So channel allow routines or functions that are executing concurrently to send and receive values of a specific type. So here we see a channel looks something like a map or an area where you can see, and that once you decide what type gets sent on it, that's the only type that can get sent on it. All right, now let's, I'm just gonna mention it because you're gonna see it and then I'm gonna show you and then show you again and then we'll do it over and over. So there are basically three ways you're gonna be able to define a channel. And you can glance at this if you like, but let's just jump into the code. So I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna save this. I might come back to it later on, depending on if we get enough time. I don't want this video to be too long. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open this and all I did was um, create a chapter seven uh, introduction and uh, do I have a yep, sections thing and I'm already in there. And so I'm gonna say um, main.go and then I'll say package and then it's a font main and then I'm gonna do fnt, fnt that print ln and um, channel, right? Now, if you look and you go to that link I sent you just now, where in the specs it talks about channel, where I got that exact um, package I just read you about what the channel is. And you see it says, the value of an uninitialized channel is nil. Well, let's see that. So I'm going to create a channel. How do you create a channel? So let's think about how you did, um, you do any variable. So variable x is int, for example, right? We have seen variable, um, you know, var a is an array, um, you know, var a is an array of 20 strings, for example. And uh, we've seen slice, var s is a slice of float 32, for example, right? Var um, map, um, var m is a map of, you know, whatever, string, right? That maps from string to um, string or integer, or whatever, right? So we've seen um, creating variables um, before. So, um, righty. So what about, um, what about this um, channel 
So you should, shouldn't be surprised that channel looks something like channel and then the type. So if we want to do a channel, uh, channel of ints, then it looks like that, just like sort of like our map looks, doesn't it? Right? And so what we're saying is that with this channel, you can only send and receive integer types on it. Okay, so let's get rid of that. Um, come on. Why is it? Okay. All right. And so I created a channel and then let's do FMT print F and I'm going to do percent V. So I'm going to say C, you know, percent V and let's do C. And so I just created a channel. I didn't use it in any way. Uh, I declare a channel. Um, and so go run main. And so my channel is nil. Okay. That's what it's telling me. My channel is nil, which is exactly what the documentation says that a uninitialized channel is nil. Now, what about if I try to get a variable from this channel, right? Well, let's talk about how do you read and write from a channel. So one way to read from a channel, reading from a channel, is to do this, is to say var v variable uh, is equals to, and I'm going to try and read from this channel c. Okay? And then what do I do if I get something from it? fmt at print line v equals the percent v and, and let's say v okay so there's a printf okay and let's see what happens when i save that and run it okay and i run it and so you can see it says go, all go routines are asleep and we didn't uh, deadlock and we didn't even do go routines yet but we're going to be able to explain that one time so when i try to read a value from a nil channel, um, it wants to block, it deadlocks. And we, we're gonna explain that thing. Same thing is gonna happen if I try to send a, a value on a channel, it's gonna deadlock. All right, so what we have to do is be able to allocate, our channel is nil right now, so C is equals to make, notice that make function again. I wanna make a channel of int, and this is just like when you go to make a slice, you can say how big it is. Well, same thing. And this is where I'm going to say make a channel um, of two, which means that I'll, you can write two values into it or store two values into two integers into it before you can store another one. So um, let's see if now when I try to preach from that channel, what happened? And same thing right and the reason here is because even though i have this channel and it has a capacity of two things can be stored in it nothing was actually written to that channel so i can actually put some send something on this channel i can do c that send something and let's send 10 and then let's do c that send 25 and now i've sent those two values 10 and 25 so first 10 then 25 onto that channel and now i can receive it and so when I try to receive from this channel, I should expect to get 10 first, okay? And there you go, and I do get 10, okay? Um, so if you have a nil channel and you try to read from it, um, or, you know, even if you don't have a nil channel, you try to read from it, if nothing is sent on it, um, thing. Now we're gonna learn later on with blocking, but we'll see. Now, there are some other things that you can do with a channel. So for example, um, you can check the length of a channel yeah and the length method works too so we can say fmt that print ln you know length of channel c uh, is a length of c right now notice this is before i initialize the channel so um let's do it again and i do it after um I initialize it and let's see so no channel notice how the length is zero and the length is zero 
See, even which is consistent with the fact that when we try to read from an initialized channel, because we didn't send anything, there wasn't anything in there, right? And after we send, we can again do the length of it before we read from it. And you know what? We should expect to see that it's two, right? And after we've re read one thing from it, we can see that there's one less in there, so the length of the channel should be one, right? And so notice we didn't have to learn any pretty new function, length on the channel, make how to make a channel. It looks just like how we did make for slices and all that good stuff. So looks the same. All right. So what's new? What we've learned so far? This is how you declare a channel. This is how you initialize it and you want it to be buffered by putting a value here. If I leave this off, it's gonna be unbuffered, and we don't really want to do that right now. So we'll learn about making unbuffered channels later when we talk about go routine. But so we always want to specify a value here, and this means how many values can I put in there before I can't put any more, okay? And basically, it's how much I can put in, in there without somebody being on the other side able to read it. And that's what we have here. We were able to put in 10 and 25 and there's nobody else on the other side reading it because we, it's buffer of two, right? And then now we can go read it after the fact. Now, if we had concurrent routines running, we could have had a routine waiting at the other end of this channel to read something as soon as we put it in. And then if it's busy, we'd be able to put in queue up two things, two more values for it before it could come back and have to read it. And of course, if we had three values to queue up and it was super busy and we queue up two, well, when we go to write that third value, we would have been blocked from writing. And again, we're going to mention a block. All it means is that our routine would have to come to a halt. It would have been prevented from proceeding because there was no place to write it. And only when the other side had read out a value and it was spaced, then it would have been able to insert that value and proceed. You will see more of it and you're going to hear more of it. So this is the first introduction to channel. I don't want to make it too long. It's kind of weird uh, if you never see anything yet. Think of channel like a pipe. And again, you could push a value down one end, somebody could pull it out the other end. Of course, they're, they're bi -bi directional too. But um, basically, you push something at one end, somebody pulls something out the other end. Okay? And that is enough for today, I think. Uh, whatever I didn't get to cover, I'll move to the next, um, to the next video. All right? All right. Take care. See you in the next video. Um, if you're looking forward to go routine in this chapter, seven sorry about that it really does make sense to cover the channel for us and i'm just going back to my original plan anyway and you will get to cover go routine if you're really missing it so anyway see you in the next video take care continue to subscribe continue to spread the word and thank you very much all right bye